Yeah, so welcome everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm so happy to be here with you. It's a small team, but uh, it's always nice to be like cozy with the workshops to have more time to, you know, answer questions. And today we're going to talk about Aperpedia. So uh, my name is Emilio Velis. Uh, I am the executive director of the Aperpedia Foundation. And I also have Andrea Maida, who's a, a colleague who works with me. And she's uh, the specialist in charge of the user support and educational material. So we want to have about uh, 30 minutes of small presentation about Aperpedia, what we do, and then to show you some key features. And then um, just a short, very short session where you can test it out and play with um, a couple of templates that we have prepared for you uh, to talk. Mainly this uh, workshop is about documentation. We want to talk about uh, what is, you know, the issue with documentation, especially when you try to leave your um, lab and how some of the people who are part of Operpedia have overcome it. So, so yeah. Um, so the objectives are to describe the purpose of Operpedia, some of the key features. We'll go really quickly. So uh, there's so much on Operpedia, thousands of, thousands of pages, but uh, we want to talk a little about the recent things that we have been developing. Uh, about the capabilities for uh, teams in terms of education, for research, and, um, and most recently for skill training. And then, uh, yeah, we want to demonstrate it with you so you can play with a little demo that we have. And then I'll take some feedback from you. We want to hear what you think about uh, the work that we're doing, how it could improve your work, and what can you recommend to us as well? So yeah, let's uh, get onto it. And yeah, the first idea that I want to portray is that uh, documentation is really difficult sometimes, especially because the medium on which you are uh, obtaining the information to reproduce anything from the real world is somewhat linear. Uh, namely a book, it could be a web page, it could be a video. So you have a, a timeline from start to finish, but the ramifications that come out of the, uh, the real world situation is quite different, right? Because sometimes you need information beforehand, you need information to prepare for what's coming up and you need to go and get uh, all the materials, the ingredients, et cetera. So that's always a hassle. And we don't think about that when we're documenting. It's usually something that comes up when we are following instructions made by someone else. So that is where the problem comes up. And in the recent years, there has been a lot of uh, effort into making documentation more accessible. Uh, for example, this uh, image right here, I, I uh, I made it for a previous workshop a couple of years ago, talking a little bit about the standards for open hardware. Uh, the Open Hardware Association, for example, has a, a nice way to divide documentation or to divide open hardware in general for, into documentation, the hardware itself, and, and then the instructions. Uh, so, so yeah, you know, you, you have uh, the, the hardware, the software, and the documentation. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, but there are so many little details that come into what you need in order to reproduce. And sometimes you have images and video, which is an asset that's outside sometimes because it's not really part of the documentation. That makes it very difficult sometimes. Uh, so that makes it so that you have to follow instructions and then go to YouTube and look for something. Um, and the creators of the devices are not thinking about making materials in that direction. But now it's becoming, you know, uh, with the advent of Bad Labs, I think most specifically, this has been uh, tamed to some degree because 
the whole concept of a fab lab is to standardize the way that you create things. So you usually have the same machines, you're using the same materials. So in terms of science, that would be reproducibility, both of the procedure, because you're using the same machine with the same tool settings, um, with the same standards of uh, procedures, and then to obtain the same result. Uh, that is very useful and part of the work that we as makers have uh, is composed of getting all of these external, uh, you know, ex yeah, all of these variables and turning them into a controlled space. And that, that is where the, the sense of a laboratory comes from. But then when, or if you have had the uh, experience of participating with other people reproducing projects, you know that sometimes it doesn't work that way quite uh, as much, but rather you have lots of different people and then they tell you, oh, I actually don't have this material, but I can use something that's very similar. We don't use inches. Our provider doesn't give us MDF in this way, etc. So lots of the work that comes around creating real impact or creating uh, material changes is hindered sometimes by the uh, gap between the perfect documentation and the real world situation. So, so yeah, what happens when we want to create, for example, um, devices that will go and be used in settings that are not the laboratory. And that's where it becomes more complicated. And we have been pondering a lot about that, but in a, in a very organic way, because that is part of the work that Apropedia does. Um, you, you've seen this last year with the, you know, the, the work of all the makers all over the world who have been uh, exploring uh, all different uh, devices for COVID-19, where sometimes Materials are not available in the same way in different places. There are different constraints. Laboratories have different assets, but most importantly, there are different skills. And one of the most important aspects that, or the, the, the lessons learned from all of this experience is that the know-how is as important as the, the simple uh, you know, list of instructions of how to make something. So in coming back to our initial example, it's not only about getting the ingredients and just putting them together, but rather there's a know-how, there's an experience that has to be obtained. And that's part of the work that the Fab Academy, Fab Academy, et cetera, are trying to bring together, right? So uh, in the case of Apropedia, we're very interested in what happens in the world outside of the laboratory, especially when you have one device that can be designed in one setting, but then the construction can be messy. It's completely different uh, to what you would expect. So documentation can only come so far. And there are many different aspects that go beyond um, the the actual documentation. So there has to be documentation on external issues, on troubleshooting, uh, and and this is where you know our experience has come in handy. Uh, Apropedia has uh, been around since two thousand and five, um, and it focuses on international development, poverty alleviation, appropriate technology, and the concept of appropriate technology has to do with how can technology be um, used in a specific setting. And that uh, you know, comes with the issues of reproducibility, with the issues of a multiplicity. And this is one example of uh, all the different instances of a specific, hold on, we have a person coming in. So this is one example of the specific instances of different devices that are out there in the world, right? So you can have um, different food dehydrators and they 
do not um, work in the same way in different settings. And that is where documentation has to, you know, take all of these externalities into account. And this is one of the uh, recent developments that we've done. Uh, this is for a, 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 a challenge called the Global Surgical Training Challenge that, that is being done with different uh, actors in the areas of health innovation. And this diagram right here is actually uh, inspired in uh, a diagram of a ty typology of open hardware. But in this case, we're looking to think about how we can not only uh, give someone or how to transfer the knowledge of building something, but also the skills in order to do it. So in this case, you have what, what in this context is the simulator, but it is hardware. Usually these uh, medical teams have been making devices such as um, bone simulators using PPC tubes or, um, or respirators, et cetera, like uh, parts of the human body made with 3D printers. Sadly, I cannot show you because uh, it, next week they, they'll be open to the public and uh, we invite you to, the, um, to this showcase that we're doing. But for now, I can only show you that we have the same type of uh, aspects of documentation that you would have in a project made by a fab lab, such as the design files, the bill of materials. So it tells you how to create a print something. But then you ha also have learning materials. You're teaching a person how they should perform a procedure in order to use this device. Um, and for that, we've created um, different types of pages meant to transfer the skills, specific knowledge and assessment, and also documentation that goes above it. So this meta documentation is more related to how we can organize together the projects. And um, so, you know, we'll show you a, a small demo in a, a minute, but I wanted to pinpoint that we're applying the principles of three different areas of openness. First, open science. Usually in open science, you have procedural knowledge. You have um, the aspects of how to perform always the same procedure in the, the right way, using the, the same uh, data, applying the same concepts. Then open hardware, how to affect a change in the environment that is physical. And then open educational resources. How can we transfer the knowledge in the same way at the same time? So, so as you see, we're trying to bring together uh, different aspects of documentation to, to put together modules of learning that can take the experience that we already have from the maker culture to create devices, but also think about what happens when you bring them to the real world. And on Upperpedia, you can find different types of projects. Some of them have been done in laboratories, um, such as fab labs or uh, academic maker spaces. But we also have some other projects, such as this one from BGM Asham that was done recently. Uh, this is the, the lab from India, then some of the projects where uh, documented using Wikipedia. And then I have a few examples. And these examples, I want to showcase some of the different tools that we have uh, brought together. So for example, this one is a, a project for a master's degree, which is how to repurpose a ventilator to make an air filter. And in this one, we have what you would see, for example, in Instructables, which is a list of steps from one to N uh, with images, but we also have annotated videos. So you can create your own videos, put them on YouTube or Wikimedia Commons, and then put them on Apropedia and document them using uh, keywords. So people can find, for example, all the DIY air filters or air filters on Apropedia by using these keywords. Um, and then, we have uh, this laboratory that has been working on Apropedia for the past, I think, 12 years uh, by um, Joshua Pierce, who was part of Michigan Tech and now is part of uh, a new university in Canada. And this is one of his projects, the RecycleBot. 
So here you see that um, him and his students do work in documenting devices that you know can be reproduced. And where you're seeing um, the standard, which is based on open know-how, and we have Andrew Lamp here with us. Uh, so, yeah, we you can, for example, and, and we also have a couple of people who were uh, yesterday at the workshop. So you can export your devices to the open know-how manifest automatically by using the metadata on the pages. And this is part of the documentation. So we've made of the standard for uh, of metadata. Uh, you know, a mandatory uh, step where people can put in information. And here you can find a multiplicity of projects and you can find them by using this uh, semantic information. We also have research documentation. So there's a lot of information that you can use here to, um, you know, some people cite um, that this actually is one of the strengths of Operpedia that is being cited over 900 times, almost 1,000 by different researchers. And you can find that Operpedia being used on Google Scholar. Um, uh, so now we're working more closely with people who are trying to make their open hardware documentation into research papers. So. Uh, you can use Apropedia as a space for preprint and people can cite it. Uh, so we have the tools for that. And then um, we have projects made in labs that are you know, in, of different types. But now I want to show you the other aspects of um, the work on Apropedia. This is the, the Global Surgical Training Challenge uh, portal that I was mentioning. And now we're moving towards different organizations opening their own portals and having uh, their space to create the documentation and to design the documentation for users. So you see here, and we'll show you in a minute that um, these um, input spaces here are for preloaded articles. So people can design for the laboratory, for example, or for a competition, a specific flavor of documentation. So if you, you want uh, people in your lab or people part of your project to document in a certain way, you can create your own preloaded pages and you can ask people to document. So this is one of the things that we've done. And uh, we have right now 10 teams who are working on um, you know, video-based tutorials or some other um, types of pages, how to build the, oh, we have something in the chat. Si, sí, está grabando, Delia. Um, yeah, so we, 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 for example, here we have, um, this is all semantic-based um, annotations. Uh, this is, for example, of sub-skills, so we can build a tree of the skills required to perform a procedure. And some of these are being used for uh, building devices or simply do surgical procedures. Then the equipment, and with the equipment, we want to build the biggest library of tools and equipment where people can not only find a certain type of equipment, but also find different alternatives that can be used in different settings. Um, and and then we have Fashion Revolution Encyclopedia, which is a smaller project that we uh, did recently along some others, one with UNDP and Techo El Salvador. And these are more related to doing mapping. So they wanted to find different instances of projects and initiatives in different parts of the world, but they are also building an encyclopedia of how to perform certain things, for example, and they're all related to the fashion industry. So how to read a, um, what do you call the, your tags, your clothes tags, but also how to uh, do, perform some sewing, how to, uh, you know, get, fix your clothing. And they want to have practical knowledge at, at the access of other people. And from all of this metadata, we're building um, maps. So we can build maps based on where are all the uh, rocket stoves around the world. And then you can put them together without 
any effort just by having well done documentation. And yeah, so we're onto the demonstration, but before I wanna show you one video that we made for the surgical training challenge uh, that explains how the metadata can be used to, to perform uh, searches. So um, I'm gonna put it, um, let me see if I'm sharing my audio. There it is. Hi, on this video, uh, we'll see some of the features of Arpopedia designed to make your content more discoverable and how to make the most of them. So to start off, this is the homepage of the Global Surgical Training Challenge. And if you scroll down, you have this quick start section from where you can create pages of different kinds. You are probably already familiar with this. So say we want to create a new skill, some skill. And this new page will load with some content preloaded on it, um, which, you, as you know, you can edit or delete as you see fit. But in this case, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the data boxes here on the right. Uh, these cards here we call data boxes, and they are designed to uh, allow you to enter and display uh, structured information about your medical skills or pages you create. So um, let's focus on this one here, medical skill data. If we click on it and edit, we can enter here some information such as the number of required hours or a list of subskills or equipment required for this skill. And if you click here on add more information and show you more, you have these five other fields, which you can use to enter more structured data about the medical skills. So for example, pathologies here. So the, the skill we are creating is relevant to hypoxia here. So we just enter that and apply changes. And we'll see the medical skill data here update with the information we just entered. So when we finish uh, um, writing out this uh, skill and save the changes, we'll get something like this. This is a finished skill. And if we look here on the right on the medical skill data, uh, we'll see some active roles and some pathologies which were entered as uh, to the data box. And the interesting thing is that you can, you or any user can click on any of these pathologies or acting roles, and by doing so, navigate to a page which will um, show basically all the pages or resources on Apropedia related to hypoxia. So this is a great way for users to find related content, but it only works if you enter the hypoxia uh, information on the on the data boxes. Uh, so this is one thing, and another related one is this this search page here. If the URL is Apropedia.org/search, we are currently working on this feature. But we'll give it more, make it more prominent, probably in the homepage uh, of Apropedia as we once it's more mature. This this page basically allows uh, users to navigate all the content on Apropedia in a more structured uh, search format. So, for example, we have this drop-down menu here, which allows us to see all kinds of content on Apropedia, including, for example, medical skills. And notice how you have these these other fields here: uh, body parts, body systems, and pathologies. And here we can enter, say, again, hypoxia, and search. And this will basically uh, take us to the same page as before, which is a list of results of medical skills uh, related to hypoxia. So this is another way in which users can find related content on Apropedia. Um, but again, it will only work correctly uh, if if you enter the information on the data boxes here on the right. Uh, these and other similar features uh, are what makes um, these data boxes so important and so powerful. They basically allow not only users, but also the software to understand uh, the nature of your content better and so allow us to develop features such as this search engine and other ones that are kind of coming up. So, well, I hope this video was useful and that the importance of data boxes is more clear now. Yeah, so- Hi, on this video, uh, we'll- Hold on, yeah. So now I will open the, the floor for Andrea to give us a small demonstration. Let us know if uh, you're able to share your screen. But in the meantime, I don't know if you have any questions. Hi, yeah, can you can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, Emilio, bueno, un placer de estar. Um, it's very nice to, to be here. I am a huge Apropedia fan. I, I have been since the inception. Uh, you guys have inspired me many, many times. Um, I, I'm interested in the open source hardware, you talked about the metadata. I wonder if you might point me to a page uh, that explains some of those standards that you were talking about before. Yeah, so we, we actually have uh, the, the author of uh, these standards, uh, Andrew Lamb. Um, we're using a, a standard that he's helping 
facilitate with uh, different uh, actors and different universities and platforms, which is called Open Know How. And I can send you the link uh, in a few moments. Yeah. And we've done our own flavor. So, as you see, we have data boxes. And the, the only difference that we've uh, put in here is that we're not only thinking about the devices, but also the, the world instances, right? So we have a, a template for projects and also for devices. And we started coming into these um, contradictions we, because we were thinking, so imagine a project that has a pretty printed bench or you know something, something that is put out there. It's not really a device because it's big or something made of uh, soil or something made of, you know, so, something with organic materials, it's difficult to call a device. It's, it's difficult. It doesn't have any ma manufacturing files. So it is a project, but sometimes projects have devices and sometimes projects have more than one device. So, you know, we were thinking of all these uh, multiplicity of uh, aspects and we, we started thinking about how can we bring all of these so that the documentation is richer and we can talk about what is happening in the lab and what are people doing, right? So uh, yeah, we'll point you to, to this information while Andrea is doing the demonstration. Super, thank you. Hi, Andrew. Just, just to say, um, I'll turn my video on. Uh, I, hope, I hope you can see me. Um, uh, just to say, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really um, glad that Apropedia has, has taken the, the concept of open know-how to its heart. I think that the, um, you know, just in, in that video there with the, with the example of hypoxia, one of the things that I find a lot of documentation um, really struggles to do around technology projects, particularly in the Fab Lab movement, is just to simply to say what a technology product does. Because, um, you know, a classic example for me was that actually a lot of people in many different, you know, parts of the world, and I work in disaster relief, so in rural South Sudan, they don't necessarily know what a pump is and what the difference between a hand pump and a rope and washer pump and a ram pump might be you know um so the um you know so so what is the pathology well in that case the pathology is potentially lifting water you know and um and they might want to say sort of water lifting from the ground or water lifting from a tank or whatever but but i think that that provides the framework. The open know-how standard was created by a committee, a group of people who are sort of doing this sort of document documentation work, including Emilio, um, who are able to contribute to the standard and uh, it's at openknowhow.org. Um, and I'm, um, you know, I'm hopeful that the next edition of open know-how um, will allow for more portability and interactivity between different platforms. There was a session on it yesterday about open know-how, the Internet of Production Alliance yesterday. So the recording will be made available after the um, Fab 16 conference with all the other videos. But I think that the, the most important thing is to remember that um, open know-how is almost like a, there are a, a few mandatory fields, but it's meant to be a minimum standard. And it's meant to be able to help platforms like Apropedia customize around it. I think the customizations that you've done, Emilio, particularly what I've seen on Apropedia around uh, relating uh, a technology product to the SDGs, for example, is really important. So yeah, th thanks, thanks for walking through that and uh, for mentioning open know-how. I think the idea of being able to generate the manifest from metadata uh, is fantastic and um, yeah, the idea that a platform might help people make their designs more discoverable uh, using a standard like that's really promising. Thanks. Yeah, thanks to you. All right, Andrea, it's your time to shine. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. 
Jadi ya. All right. No worries. Probably we have some uh, technical issues, so I'll take over. Let's see. I have it right here. So yeah, I'll, I'll, in fact, I would like to show you um, while Andrea comes back, let me see if I can move my screen. Yes. All right, so, so if you want to uh, just, speaking about what Andrew just mentioned, can you see my screen? I just want to make sure that I, I, I moved. Uh, yeah, we can see it, yeah. Perfect, all right, so this is, this is the um, example. This is one first approximation that we're doing to the amount of search of power and the power that you can have while creating new projects. So if you have, we're, we're basically adding all sorts of keywords to, to Appropedia and we're on this process of standardizing them because there are so many but you can, for example, look for instances of a stove and it should have, um, it, sh it should give you an answer. Let's see, or solar. Let's see if it works. I hope it doesn't let me down right now. Let's see. Yeah, so we have these projects that have the keyword solar and you can also do this by Let's see, I don't know how to delete it, there it is. And then you can also um, search by SDG. So you can search by specific projects that have been tagged and all of our projects on Appropedia have, if you go to them, you will find um, these, this is the old standard that we're using, but um, let's see if I can find like, Let's see, this is the one that I was looking for. Um, yeah, so we have, for example, the status, was it made, replicated, and people who were yesterday at the workshop on the open know-how standard will see that they're similar. And we also have similar to other platforms that you can find specific manufacturing files. But some people, what they do is that they create their uh, documentation in other places. And they just create a page on Amperpedia describing what it is so that we can have a structured semantic uh, and you know, uh, organized uh, source of information. And then we can point people to different directions. You put them in a map so you can create maps specifically um, for, I want to find all the appropriate technology projects for a specific SDG in a specific country and you can do that already on Appropedia. So, so yeah, um, and we have, we wanted to show you also the, the preloads. Let me see. So we created this, this page, let me see. I will create a new share. Andrea is your, yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Ah, now? there you go. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, my microphone was misbehaving. So I had to plug it out and plug it back in. My computer was kind of lagging a little bit, but I'm here now. So um hi everyone. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> my name is Andrea Maida. I work with Emilio at Apropedia. I'm a learning module specialist, which means I'm basically in charge of uh finding ways for Apropedia users to make uh better content, but also um finding ways to integrate them in an in easy, fun, and smart ways in order for them to share their knowledge uh, using this um, op our open knowledge uh, philosophy, right? So basically, Emilio right now gave us a really broad overview of what we do at a technical level, but I'm going to talk about the mushy stuff, something that sometimes if we're familiar with documentation and hardware, we really don't take the time to stop and think about, but I think it's necessary for you, you all to understand 
what we do at Apropedia when we talk about documentation and why we do it in this way. So uh, I'd like to share my screen with you. Uh, hopefully my computer won't pass out now. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna give you a tiny little demo of what we're doing and what we were talking uh, about with Emilio, right? Um, so uh, what we do with Apropedia is uh, document projects, but not in the way that other platforms may do. Obviously, we, uh, we at the heart of our um, philosophy and our purpose as an organization is uh, it's the core belief that uh, we can create a richer world, a more humane world, if we make knowledge not only open, but also accessible and adaptable to every uh, person need. So what we do in order to do that, and the, the way that we make this open philosophy our own, is um, we try to implement uh, documenting methodologies and documentation um, experiences that focus not on obtaining an exact replica of the outcome, but an outcome, but various types of outcomes that are available for any person in any context and with uh, the resources they have at hand, right? So we do have a technical component, but that's not the main purpose. Our purpose is uh, for people to attain an idea of know-how of, uh, we're not interested in them for example, to reproduce, reproduce a specific type of hardware, we are interested in people learning how to create their own hardware uh, based on their processes in uh, basic principles that anyone can learn and attain in, in the hopes that they use our platform uh, to document this knowledge. And so we have a like, rich repository of uh, different techniques, devices, projects. And in this manner, <laughs> we think we like to think. We are sure that we contribute to uh, making a better world, right? So I'm going to try and search um, the example that we were talking about with Emilio. Let me just this down here. Oh my God, I have a moving tab. Sorry. I put it in the that. chat. <laughs> yeah. Let me go ahead and try that. Okay. Oh my God. I'm sorry. My computer is really not behaving right now. So. Mm -hmm. Emilio, I'm not able to find it right now. Uh, could you please share your screen? With us and, and yes. Yeah. Yes. Hold on. Because I'm not finding that window. And oh my God, my God. No worries. No worries. <laughs> um, it's really not gotcha. working with me right now. Yeah. Okay. So what we want to show you is that we can produce a vast body of knowledge uh, based on simple technologies and simple items and simple devices. And we were uh, discussing this with Emilio this week and uh, we reached a conclusion that really um, knowledge like this can be, can be produced uh, from basic things and from basic everyday needs. So, I mean, a sandwich is like a quasi universal type of food, right? You can create it with many ingredients, you can use different procedures uh, to cook it, but the basic principles of assembling the sandwich remain the same, right? So what we're trying to do is to tell, not to tell people, this is the standard sandwich, this is the sandwich that you have to create. This is the only outcome that you can um, produce from this process, but we're trying to tell. We know a sandwich is a very basic thing uh, we know um, you can create your own and all the sandwiches you can create in different parts of the world are valid, right? So this is basically an example of the type of documentation and the type of experience that we want people to have when they document. Um, we try to create preloads as Emilio was telling you um, in order for our users uh, to start with a 
without the need to be experts in documentations or research, we offer them the opportunity to just bring the data or just bring their experiences to us and provide them with a guide on how to appropriately document them. And in addition to that, we are also monitoring new pages constantly and trying to help them uh, with editing and such. We also try to create um, databases or content trees such as the ones you're able to see in the explore content section that contribute to enrich this body of knowledge, right? with the idea that one, it, this should be easy to use, two, the knowledge you bring to our platform should be easy to document, and three, this uh, type of content uh, should be openly available, and uh, when you're consulting one, one of our articles or pages, it should seem easy to reproduce. Uh, we're not trying, we're not a technical journal, we're not a scientific journal, we're basically a, a fountain of free knowledge um, for example, in our country, we sometimes have communal uh, ponds or communal sources of water. That's what we're trying to do here. We're not trying to gatekeep knowledge or to uh, force our users to be experts. We're trying to tell you, you already have the expertise, the experience and the results. We only give you a platform for you to uh, share this with the world and for you to enrich this with other types of knowledge. So basically, this is what it should look like. but. Uh, Emilio, I'm sure you have there those links. We want to show you also what this idea looks like in real life when we implement it in real projects that we're currently working on uh, with uh, various objectives, goals, and various results. Because we think that this type of documentation doesn't only work on hardware or on specifically technical projects. We also use this uh, documentation methodology on more research-oriented projects. We use it, as Emilio was telling you, on medical research and medical learning. Um, our point is this can be applied in a plethora of topics. Really, the sky is the limit, but this also means that we, as a platform, uh, have the task of not only making this content accessible, but also making our users feel, making any user feel that this is knowledge that they can put to use immediately. So, are you, are you controlling my my computer, Andrea? No, I'm not touching it. Hold on. Yeah, it said that someone was trying to take control of my. That was weird. Hold weird. On. Yeah. Yeah. That was the YouTube thing. Hold on. Um, okay. There we are. I'm gonna get back. Yeah. So, so for now, what we want to share, if you want, um, please go to the to the screen to the page that we've uh, sent to you on the chat, and you can play with it. You can create a preload, um, and you know. Uh, are you able to to go in? I think we are having some sort of um, weird thing happening with. Um... Yeah, uh, Emilio, just to say, I did not say that you are an idiot. Uh, <laughs> there's a chat message that says Emilio is an idiot, uh, and that's attributed to me. Uh, I did not do that. No worries. Yeah, it 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 was saying that. Uh, yeah, and someone was taking over control uh, of the. And I think it's it's the user here. Let me see if this is. Um, hold on. It it looks like uh, it is. Yeah, I, I I think it was this user who came in. And it said that Andrea was requesting for my screen sharing and I just gave her control and then, yeah, no, all good. All right, um, so yeah, continuing with the demo, if you wish, uh, feel free to go to the, oh, hold on, this is not it. Um, it is, this is the one. So that is the preload, that is, so that's the way that we work with the pages on Upperpedia, we create these um, preloaded templates for people to work on. And then if you go to this other page, you can open it up and you know you can play with it. 
um, there's a there's the option to create a sandwich. So you can, you know, create an option for a sandwich there and document it. So hold on, I'm going to share my screen again here. So imagine you want to make a BLT sandwich. So you just go in, create, and then um, as we mentioned, someone has already created a, a documentation flavor for you. So you can edit this, and this is very useful for users who are not as tech savvy, and you want them to add their information. So you know. So yeah, and then you can edit the information here about the project. So this, this data box here is very specific for what the project is about, who made this project, not necessarily about the person making the documentation. So you can add here information about how much it costs, uh, et cetera. And this one is about the page. So this is more about who created this page. So in this case, it is me. So I can do either my name or I can use my Apopedia name and it attributes me. So the idea is that all pages can be attributed and this is very useful for, for uh, people who are doing research um, for all sorts of things that they can find who the authors are. So this is some sort of, not necessarily a research paper, but it is um, uh, a step in the direction, right? So it, I can say, here that I made my sandwich in India or that I did it in San Salvador. And then with this, I can save the page and I don't need to code. So this is one of the, um, the tools that we're, you know, we're playing with. And what we try to do is that when organizations or people from teams want to create changes, uh, want to start doing documentation and they want to do changes to the templates, we can you know, create specific tools for whatever they want to do. So, so yeah, uh, it's open for you. You don't need to, for now, you don't need to uh, put a register to edit the, the Apropedia page, but um, yeah, we want to give you a couple minutes while we're doing the, this for you to play, or if you have any other questions, we can do that, right? So uh, we can answer those. I don't know if, if you have any. No questions? Yeah, I have a, I have a thought and, and a question. Um, for some for some time now, I've been working with GIS. Um, I've also worked with groups like UN Habitat and sort of disaster relief situations. Um, and GIS is, you know, geographic information systems is quite an interesting uh, way to form uh, way ways to stumble upon interesting solutions. And so I, I've been working with that. I wonder, I wonder if you have any thoughts or ways to implement GIS um, as part of a pro -previa. And my second yeah, question- you know, oh, please. How, how can I help? Let me help. You know, I'm, I'm here to help. So GIS and how do I help? <laughs> oh, perfect. All right. Um, so we're doing, we have this one project with uh, the UNDP. Uh, which is starting and what they're doing is this is for the UNDP accelerator labs and they're trying to find appropriate technology specific for water in different cities uh, in El Salvador. So what we did, Andrea has been working specifically on preloads for here you see that we have three. This is for a community profile. So if you see here, this is a community profile that was created here. And we had university students, volunteers who have been documenting what they saw in the community, right? So, and 
for now, we have only added location, uh, you know, points. We can have up to 10 points. Our template can extend, but we've done only 10 of uh, community profile. Uh, this one is about access to water situation and then devices. So they're doing specific things. And then here we are using a, a template for MediaWiki to create the maps. So for now we're doing very simple maps. We want to you know, just approximate, see what, what we do with this information. Um, we don't yet have the capability for doing other GIS related you know, information such as polygons, et cetera. But uh, depending on you know, how we extend, I think we can start thinking about new possibilities to implement GIS. But having said this, um, the fact that we have all of this information well-structured helps us so that we can connect to an API, for example. So the first approximation of the data can be done on a Propedia, and then we can move to another platform. Uh, and yeah, that's part of the work that we're doing with Open Know How. The, the fact that we can you know, just click and export metadata uh, templates here on YAML or you know, aggregate it. Etc. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. And then about helping, um, well, you you can do two things. One is if you're interested in just editing a Propedia, we have lots of things. You know, little little projects that we're undergoing right now that we can, you know we can uh, point you to. But if you are really interested in doing something big uh, with a Propedia, is by uh, bringing organizations to use a Propedia. I think it's that's one of the things that we want to have organized information, especially because nonprofits, um, in general, organizations, labs, uh, people who are doing work on the field, they're not good at documenting. So we, we want to make it easier for them. Um, and we want to use this information not to live on a Propedia, but we want this information, for example, one of the things that we're trying to do is have offline access. One of the projects that we will undertake in the next couple months is using uh, KiWeeks. And there's a, one of the modules of the Global Surgical Training Challenge will be deployed in Africa for surgical training. So that is something that is happening right now. Um, and then another one is turning all of this information into printable material. So how we can have a multiplicity of uh, formats and we can convert back and forth instead of editing, you know, taking from the website to uh, uh, Google Doc and then editing, et cetera. We want to have the, the final information so that it can live on our Propedia as technical briefs and we can port it to different formats. So yeah, Felipe, you have a question? Yeah, I do. I just noticed, I was actually wondering about this before, but I didn't just noticed that this page that you're showing is in Spanish. And I yeah. was thinking how expensive it is. I would say that if it is based on MediaWiki, it would be only a matter of adding new pages in other languages, but is there a way to create an index page in Portuguese in my case? Yeah, so, so one, of the, one of the discussions that we've had all this year is about how to implement multi-language support. Uh, and that was, if you see, for example, how Wikipedia has done it, they have multiple installations of MediaWiki. So they have different platforms and they all have the same. But in the case of Apropedia, it didn't make sense to do something like that because you can have, for example, one technical brief. Let's say I'm going to write a page on how to build a certain type of rocket stove, right? So you, so you, you go to the rocket stove page and there are multiplicity of very similar devices that were created, right? So, and there can be documentation that is created in different languages uh, for the same device, but it's not the same experience of creating it. So there are two ways. One is we have um, automatic translation. So you, depending on what the language of the page is, you can automatically translate using Google Translate. You can you know, go and translate to all types of, you know. so this is the easiest way of doing it. 
But then for specific uses, we what we have done, I think it's, let's see if I can find it quickly. Um, one example of what I want to show you is a page about washing clothes and people wanted to translate it because they were like, no, we want to have this, you know, they want to have this page in multiple languages because here it is. Because it, we want our um, public or our target audience to read it correctly. So this is a page in Spanish, but we are using that as derivatives. So we are creating, instead of saying this is uh, the, the Spanish or English version, it's more of a derivative, derivative. And this can happen also when you're writing a technical brief on how to build documentation, how to build something. And then you revisit it five years later and you say, huh, I, you know, I think there's a better way to do it. And you can either change the page, edit it, or you can say, I'm going to make a derivative saying, this is how I thought it was. And now this is how I am going to build it. So. So here, yeah, so this is the way that we are trying to build this multiplicity of, we're talking about the same, but in different ways. And what we want to do with this is, for example, you have a project that is building documentation for a specific uh, group of people in Syria. And then they say, well, I want to do it in Afghanistan, but it has to have some specific changes such as images, photos, etc. We you can make a derivative derivative of that. And this is similar to how open educational resources work by adapting uh, very specific um, you know elements of different pages and creating derivative derivative works. So yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. I hope it does. Yeah it does. I just noticed also that I can search for the property language code and then attribute the value. Yeah. Yes. And then that yes. will allow a user to create uh, a kind of index in all the, with all the pages that that user wants to feature in a kind of, you know, a hypothetical Spanish uh, homepage that could be, I guess, done, right? Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. yeah. We so we, 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 what we're trying to do is put it all in together and, um, Try, try to encourage participation. Instead of dividing the communities, we want them to work together and think of people, hey, we're going to translate these pages because they're useful to us. And we're also trying to prompt people to document as they work. Um, instead of saying, um, I'm going to sit down and work on all these pages. You know, I'm going to translate all of them. Instead of that, we want to have people saying, I'm going to document as I create it. And I'm going, you know, I am in a, in a Spanish speaking country and I'm going to use this uh, documentation for a workshop. I'll just translate it right now, you know, and make it. And in a way, pages on Operpedia describe what is happening in the real world. What is, you know, the instances of things being built um, and people saying, hey, I just built this and this is our experience, et cetera. So, so yeah. Any other if questions? If I could just um, can say, um uh on jonathan's question uh sorry to do another plug but the uh open nowhere standard uh, which was nicknamed because um the idea of a, a standard for know-how became quite popular so knowing where to make things uh became quite important the open nowhere standard is a new standard that was released um a couple of months ago to try and have to try and publish the geographic location of machines so not necessarily the, the products that are made um and that's documented in that propedia but the machines so you know where to make something you take an open nowhere design and you work out where to make it blah 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 um but i'm intrigued uh perhaps uh if you could say a little bit more jonathan sorry to um go on a tangent in this discussion that would often happen when we're all in a room together but it's less common on a webinar if you could say what some of the benefits of the gis search that you're talking about would be please jonathan 
Yeah, sure. I mean, just also to put this out into everyone's sort of hands. Um, so I've been I've been working on a a, a platform called Open Lab, which for the, which is like the past ten years. Um, unfortunately, I've been running a, a fab lab in Barcelona, in the Green Fab Lab, which ran my soul into the ground. Um, so I've, I'm now. I'm now working much more in this direction so i i think that if you if we are able to use gis to categorize regional conditions especially ecological indicators uh environmental geographic information we are use we can use that information uh as a relational search engine to find projects of similarity and we can we can use that also to find people and experts of similarity as well. So that means directly Great, if, yeah. if you are in a place of a certain salination soil quality, then finding somebody else on the other side of the planet who shares the very same condition means that you can work together in a better way. So di distributed networks of regional similarity powered by a geo gis condition uh polygons as i think emilio <laughs> said um so that that's that's really yeah. what i'm working on um yeah and you know we we're experimenting with something very similar for we have a section for um environmental news that is being actively edited by one of our most uh, adamant editors on Apropedia. And we are working on a template, which I cannot find for the love of my life, um, which is something similar to that, like near me. And you can find projects in your vicinity. Um, but one example that I can find probably is, might not be the best, you know, we're, the, we're, we're still working on the, uh, maps template or here's one example of this so the one that you saw before is for all pages close to a, a specific project and this one is everything that's close to me you know organizations projects in el salvador right so you can find different things and and explore different you know these are uh, university projects that have been done and then some you know, users, etc. So yeah, you can find organizations, people. So you can put them together if you map them on Monopopedia. We, we actually have something uh, for the Fashion Revolution Encyclopedia. We have something of the sort, which is a directory of brands that are doing upcycling. So these are basically some sort of makers, right? Because they're creating brands and each of them have their page showing off what they create and you know that they're doing all this upcycling uh, directory etc and there's the location which is added to the page and it's actually uh, an address so you you can find the address and then they're all here in the map so you can find them all here so you can see near you here's the one that we were looking at so yeah, that's you know something that's very doable right now on Apropedia. If you want, you know, if you have a community of people who want to, let's create a directory for blah blah blah. You know, and then if you say we're going to move to a different platform, there's a, an extension, you know, a, a special page where you can export or you can import information. So what we're trying to have is, you know, is for Apropedia to be a, a an open space where people can come in, use the documentation, play with it. And, you know, it doesn't have to be live on Apropedia. You can use it for other purposes. And that's part of the, the mindset that we want to create for organizations or for groups who are working on Apropedia, that, you, you know, the information is yours. You can use it as you wish. All right. Yeah, I think, I think uh, it's time to wrap up. Thanks so much. Uh, to everyone and for the great, you know, participation and you know, just to have these spaces. If um, if you may, please stay in touch. If you're interested in, uh, you know,
collaborating on Africidia. You know, we're super happy to have you with us. So, yeah. Any last comments? Anyone? No. Good. Thank you very much. Super interesting and great work. All right. Yeah, thanks, Emilio. I'm sorry you had that little uh, difficulty with the uh, <laughs> uh, unhelpful user, and I'm, I'm mortified by the idea that um, my, it appeared in the chat as if my name was used to say bad things about you and Andrea, because I think the work you're doing is, is spectacularly exciting, and um, the world needs more of this as a, as a global public good, so, um, uh, so keep it up. Thanks Hold a on. lot.